Matt here again from Media Arts Technical Team. We're going to take a look now at the Zoom F4 portable recorder, which is the best option for standalone uh, double system audio recording in the field. Um, and it can also act as an audio interface, for example, if you want to go home and record some instruments straight onto your laptop, you can put this in USB mode as an interface, so just as an aside. But most of you will be using this in the field as a portable recorder. So, there's a manual for this recorder that's quite large. Um, I'm going to try and condense a lot of this information and give you just what you need to know. However, I will take you through as many things as I think are relevant as possible. Um, we're going to start off looking in through the menu um, before we come on to the front panel because I think it's important to know how to set the device correctly before you go on to use it. Otherwise, you're using without really knowing the back end of it. Um, but just to kick off, um, just talk a bit about power and the ergonomics of the Zoom and why you might use it over a smaller device such as the H5. So the main advantages to using the Zoom over the H5 are that it's got more inputs. I'm just going to um, disconnect the power here. And we'll just take a look at the inputs on the side. I'm just going to zoom in here with the camera. Um, so we've got four inputs here on the side, and they're numbered one, two, three to four. <laughs> Just be careful when you're operating the zoom, because when you have the zoom in the pouch, and uh, I'll just show you the pouch very quickly. Here's the pouch. When you have the zoom inside the pouch, um, it's hard to see the numbers of those inputs. So you should know in advance that it's one, two, three, four because if you're plugging a mic into what you think is input one, but it's actually input four, because it's the other side, um, you're actually gonna lose some time there troubleshooting why you're not getting that level. Um, you might think it's something else, like phantom pair not being turned on, but actually it's in the wrong input. Um, so this is the bag, just while I've got it on here for the Zoom. Um, and this is the second main reason that the Zoom is um, preferable to using the smaller H5. Simply the ergonomics of this bag on the Zoom are really handy in the sense that you don't need to use your hands, it's hands-free. You've got full view and control of the recorder as you're looking down there. Um, obviously you can take this off, you can have it on if it's raining or if it's uh, adverse um, conditions. Um, but you've got full control of the device here, it sits in it's really easy to adjust, even if you're holding a boom, it's actually quite simple to adjust the input gain or the volume or some other setting of the zoom without uh, putting the boom or the mics down in your hands. So you can access both the inputs and the outputs of the zoom and all the uh, connections on the side. Also, it's got this great little battery case here at the bottom, so you can put um, an external battery and, and you might even be able to put um, your phone if you've got enough room there. So, on airplane mode, of course. Uh, super handy, that, that is. But the third reason that the Zoom is advantageous to um, using a smaller H5 is the output side. We'll come on to this in a short section just to touch upon it now briefly. You've got more options here in terms of do you want to send your audio signal to someone else on set as you're recording? And that is really um, handy for the director and for other people to know what's going on in, in Soundland. Otherwise, you're one person island in the crew. So that being said, it's very similar in terms of the kind of theory behind it and the settings and features to the H5 or to other, for example, sound devices, um, industry standard recorders. Um, however, it's just literally the shape and the, some of the options are slightly more expanded. Um, so what I'm saying here is, regardless of whether or not you've used a smaller external recorder before or not, um, it really makes sense to come onto the Zoom F4 as soon as possible, really. And there's nothing wrong with just this being your first audio external recorder that you use. You don't have to step up from a smaller one. Just come straight onto this and you're going to enjoy all the advantages that it has over smaller, more limited recorders straight away. You don't need to sort of incrementally gear up to using this, just go straight in for it, which is hopefully why we're doing this video, it will help you today. So in terms of power, we've got this power supply here that Mark has kindly bought in for the department. Um, I think it's a Heroes connector there at the end. And um, this is great, it basically gives us a load of charge 
as long as this is fully charged in advance, which it should be, you should have plenty of recording time there um, to film all through the day while you're giving phantom power to the mics. So just make sure it's charged in advance. It will be if it comes from the stores, but if you're using it for multiple days, you're going to have to charge it yourself over USB. Just be aware of that. Keep it off when you're not using it and simply connect it to the Zoom with the Heroes connector, Hi Rose. You can kind of put it in position and you can swivel to feel where it clicks in. Slightly fiddly, but once you've got it, it's a fairly solid connection then. Okay, so that is now ready to go. I'm going to turn on the battery pack and then you get these LEDs on the side showing you the power status of the battery. It's fully charged, that's gonna last all day and I can send phantom power and I can still have a full day of recording time. Okay, so all this being said, we're gonna start looking at uh, through the menu um, and through all the features and settings um, as per the Zoom F4 setup guide that's on Moodle. So it's all relevant and hopefully it all makes sense. You just need to get yourself a Zoom and follow along. Um, so first things first, to turn on, power button's tiny, it's down here. Just gonna make sure that we can see the screen nice and clearly here. So you might get a warning when you turn on that there's no card in one of the slots or two of the slots, um, which is no, no real problem as long as you're expecting to only use one of the slots. But if you've got no card in two slots, then you've got nothing to record onto. So um, we've got an SD card in the back here in slot one. No biggie, we've got nothing in slot two, that's fine. We'll just use SD card one. So closing that up nice and secure. And by the way, this is where um, you can stash a load of uh, AA batteries to power the device um, if you have that battery module to slot in there, but it's much preferable to use the power bank. Okay, so here we go. Um, first things first, in order to navigate through the Zoom, um, similar to other devices, we have a main menu button, and then we have a kind of scroll or, or uh, a toggle switch um, that also can be depressed, um, not sad, but pressed, to select menu items. So um, that's how we navigate through. And the first thing we want to do is reset the Zoom recorder. So um, like I mentioned in the other video, you've got no idea of knowing whether or not this recorder, this device, just like any other camera, has been left in a really bizarre, unusable state for your application. It might be set for a very specific uh, use case, uh, for example, it might be set for a very sensitive um, pickup in a very uh, sensitive environment and it might have lots of uh, perhaps settings that are enabled that you don't want for your particular application. So um, there's other more important elements that um, are affected by the, re the resetting function, such as the output monitoring. We'll come to that shortly, but basically there are things that can go wrong and it's more likely that things will go wrong if you don't reset the device, just like if you take out a uh, FS7 camera and there's something going on um, that you, uh, you don't want on your, on your setting, such as resolution, or um, perhaps um, it's, it's got something locked out that you're trying to access. So in order to do this, press the menu button and scroll down and you wanna go for system and factory reset, yes. And with other devices as well, there's gonna be quite a few things you'll see in the menu here um, that we don't actually need to dive into in too much detail now, but just be aware of them and by all means learn the menu if you can. Um, but we're just gonna look at the high level, most important settings today. Um, and then if you've got very specific uh, use requirements like time code, we can talk about that separately. So um, turns off after the factory reset, so back on. <laughs> now we're going to uh, get a prompt here that we need to set the clock, which is important for metadata. Um, we're going to skip it right now. It can be used for time code as well, but we'll skip that just for now. No need. Um, we get that SD2 card, no, no card warning again. And then we come back to the home screen and all the settings now should more or less be set um, at a sensible uh, value. However, there are some that aren't. Um, such as the default time code frame rate. 
um, that's okay, that's fine. Just ignore that for now unless you're using time code. We'll go through all of the most important settings. And the very first thing you should be doing now is formatting the SD card because, well, it may have been formatted in a computer and it might be a bit corrupt or um, more likely to be corrupt during your filming. So uh, we want to format that straight away. So come down to SD card in the menu, press that, and you can format the card there. You can format, format card SD or you can format SD card one or two there and it will um, wipe the card and re-index it for recording on the F4. So now um, we're going to confirm the record settings of the zoom. Um, and if we look at the top, it doesn't give us an uh, indication of what bit rate or resolution until we scroll. Um, it's probably worth saying now that there's different kind of home screens, if you like. So these are the screens that you just toggle through without pressing the menu button. And the different monitoring home screens, you can say. And uh, you can see that this one, for example, it gives you the audio level at the bottom. And it gives you some information on recording time, resolution, um, all that sort of thing. Whereas some of the other ones, they show you um, different information instead, um, depending on what screen you like to work off when you're operating the Zoom. Personally, I like to operate on this screen here. Um, to kick things off, and then I perhaps move to um, one of these other screens. Um, so it depends on your own uh, style of working, but um, you've got options there. So we want to change the record settings, or we want to be aware of how we can change them if they're not set to WAV 48 kilohertz or 24 bits, because we can't see it's 24 bits. So we need to be able to go in there. Um, so press the menu button and go into Rec and Play. Terminology can be different to other Zoom devices. And then now we're seeing a lot of what's happening under the hood in terms of how it's recording. Now remember, the Zoom is a um, four XLR input recorder, but there are actually additional inputs. Um, I think they're on the side. Oh, sorry, they're on the, yeah. So you've got um, input five and six here. Um, or you've got mic in at the back, there is an option to expand um, the microphone with the Zoom's uh, connector type there. So it is possible to record six inputs. Um, however, it's got four native XLR ins. So in the rec play section of the menu, um, we can actually record different channels to different SD cards. Um, and we can record either uh, a poly WAV or multiple mono WAVs. And this is an area of much debate online if you Google it. However, I would just say that it's fine to leave it as a poly WAV, um, which is the default setting. And you can always split it in post and do various things. It just keeps it all nice and tidy. So you, like I say, on SD2, you could record, um, for example, you can record the stereo left and right mix of all the four microphones, which is just mixing four down to two channels. And you could do that on SD card two, but really there's no real logic to that unless you've got a specific reason to. Um, importantly, the sample rate should be 48 kilohertz and the bit depth should be 24 bits. So this refers to the resolution, the quality of your audio recording, and that should match your NLE or your post-production workflow. Um, very important to get that right all along for consistency and dynamic range and uh, that's where that's set. So just take note of that if you need to change it, there it is. Similarly, with any microphone that needs condenser power for other recorders, we also need to provide phantom power to condenser microphones on this device. Otherwise, the condenser microphone just won't work. You won't get any sound from the microphone if it's a condenser mic unless you send it power from the device. And we've got a big old power bank for the Zoom F4. So we can send um, four mics phantom power and it won't deplete too quickly on our battery. Um, and there is two different ways to do this. But for now, I'm going to show you the menu way of doing it. We'll come on to the external controls shortly. But in the menu, if you go to input and you have the phantom option in there and you can actually enable it for each individual input one to four or just all of them at the same time. So it's handy to know that if you wanted to see what's going on at the phantom power for all channels at one time and you can change the voltage because some mics 
need less than others, but leave it at 48 unless you have a reason to and disable power saving, um, which is the default. So you can see now how that factory reset will apply a lot of sensible settings for you. It's just that you need to tweak a few things and you're much better off for having done that factory reset because you never know if someone's got something like power, sa power saving enabled there that could potentially trip you up and disable one of your mics or something else that's unexpected. Now, I'm not gonna go into it really but it does have an option to set time code um, in the time code area of the Zoom. Now, what this is in a nutshell is the ability to lock synchronization between the audio and the video cameras on set as you're filming. So um, in the UK, we usually go 25 frames time code and we set our NLEs and our DAW post um, software to be the same and it's really, really handy. It's the best way of syncing and it's the most professional industry standard way you'll see on set. You can actually send time code wirelessly now using uh, tentacle sync devices that you can buy online. They're quite expensive, but your camera needs to be able to accept time code. So the FS7s don't without an external module, but it's just good to generally be aware of time code. All it is is essentially you send a time code signal from one device to another. You set one device to generate the time code and the other devices to to slave the time code, to receive the time code from the, the master device. And it just keeps everything locked in. It, it inserts that information in the metadata. So you have an instantaneous sync across all of your audio and, and video content, but you need to have a device that receives a time code and you use um, a BNC type um, HTSDI cable to send and receive it. So moving on from that now, that's sort of more advanced stuff. Um, in the absence of time code, you'll be using good old clapperboard um, and you'll be using scratch audio on the cameras. Every camera can record some sort of scratch audio track and um, NLEs like Premiere can just sync that up straight away immediately. However, time code is, is better for large projects. So moving on now, we're going to mention again the importance of setting the input gain in correctly individually for each of the four audio channels. Because remember, you've got four mics coming in there and all the mics have slightly different um, discrepancies, if you like, between how they operate. So you'll need to set all the input levels independently and those microphones will be used, positioned in different locations on set. So it's really important when you're recording a microphone that the incoming audio level hits in that Goldilocks zone of between around minus 24 dB to minus 12 dB. That is the sweet spot where you want the dialogue to be. So it's really important that you do a sound check, ideally before rehearsal, so that you can see, you can anticipate, you can preempt the sort of input level that you need to set the device at for that individual speaker or on that individual microphone corresponding to that speaker on set. So um, I've got a lapel microphone receiver here. Uh, I'm going to plug this into channel one on the side just so that I can get some level into the device. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to set this up. Um, so at the moment, nothing's happening on the recorder. You can see that it's basically just showing blank on the home screen. Um, and I'm going to want to activate channel one and set the incoming level for that so that it's a nice signal. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that I've already set my input gain correctly on the transmitter wireless microphone and the receiver. So I'm confident that both the transmitter and the receiver levels are in that Goldilocks zone and giving me a nice signal to noise ratio for the recipient device, which is the Zoom. So um, if you heard distortion, for example, on the Zoom, um, you wanna check logically if it's happening on the transmitter, if it's happening on the receiver, and I'm confident that I've set those correctly. So if I hear distortion, I know it's because the Zoom settings are simply too high or incorrect. Um, and the, the mics that are feeding in there should be at mic level um, if you have an option between mic and micro line. So I'm pretty confident now that I'm gonna focus on the zoom and I'm not gonna bring the radio mics into the equation. The very first thing that you need to do when you've got a mic connected is on the correct channel. So um, when I press channel one there, immediately that signal comes right through and um, I've got different ways of seeing that level come through. 
I like to see um, this screen, which is um, an indication of where the um, input gain settings are. Um, and it also shows you, um, this is the, at the bottom here, the, the pot that's transparent. That's actually like a fader. So there's a difference between those two. Um, the top one is the trim gain, which is setting the incoming level of signal. And the bottom one is more like an output stage. So that's the volume at which that predetermined level sends to the output of the um, device. It's important to understand that difference because if you have bad audio, like if you have too much gain applied and you're distorting and peaking, then you have to adjust the trim and not the output or not the headphone volume or something else. It's the trim that you're concerned about. So um, there's different ways of seeing the signal come in. I like to just check on the screen that shows me the actual dB amounts at the bottom here. Um, that gives me a really nice indication of um, exactly where the audio is at. So I think that's too high because I'm talking at a regular volume while I'm trying to project for the video, but it's going into the amber. It's kind of going too close to that zero dB point. Potentially, if I make a loud noise, it's going to distort and you've got problems there. So um, I want to stay in that Goldilocks zone of between minus 12 and minus 24 dB. And remember, it's an inverse scale. So the closer it goes to zero, the louder it becomes. Okay, so um, that's fine. This particular view is showing me um, the output side. So the four inputs go to left and right output, which is stereo output. I want to see the individual inputs. Um, and on this screen, it, it's got a way of showing you both the individual inputs and the outputs. Um, but I don't really need to see um, the sort of main and sub. I just want to see four individual mics coming in here. And you've actually got six here and left and right. That's fine. So um, various screens have their pros and cons. It's just a different way of showing you the information that the Zoom is capturing. And if you had additional microphones, you would enable these channels here. You would have all four of them turned on, and you would need to set the gain accordingly so that each individual microphone is around about the minus um, 24 to minus 12, or in this case, minus 18 to minus 12, is kind of showing you um, that region there. Um, but yeah, more or less minus 24 or minus 12, that's my kind of sweet spot for the best signal to noise ratio. Okay, now, so I've shown you how to apply phantom power through the menu. Um, but once you get going with the zoom, like once you've kind of gone through the menu and set those settings so that it's all um, as per your project requirements, you can then start to operate from the outside, from the external buttons of the zoom. And um, there's a PFL button here. And by pressing that, it will sort of uh, monitor that individual mic, what's going on on that individual channel without changing or without muting the other channels to the recorder. Um, and that's really handy. It allows you to isolate what's happening on each microphone without changing what you're recording. And in addition to that, it gives you a load of extra settings that are specific to that channel. So when you press PFL, the channel LED will go yellow and you will get settings that are all specific to that individual track. So if you want to do anything that's related to one microphone, press PFL, you can listen to that, and then you can make settings um, specific to that track, including phantom power application on or off. So this is really handy. Um, this is the preferred way of applying phantom power, uh, really because you only apply it to the channels that you need to. So here, um, we can apply phantom power. And by the way, if you press um, a PFL button, when you've recorded and when you're playing back a recording to check it, then it will isolate the individual microphone um, even though you've already recorded it. So really cool, you can actually check individual microphones after you've recorded a take to check, to make sure that that person on set said that line in that way that is intelligible and that serves the, um, the director and the, the script. You've got some other options individually on each channel such as um, filters and limiters. And a limiter is quite handy. It can get you out of a bit of bother if you're, um, maybe you're in a really loud place or you're not aware of um, the input level being too high and it, it basically goes up to zero. 
instead of distorting, a limiter will prevent it from reaching that zero dB point um, by applying a very high ratio compression. And um, you can come and chat to me about whether or not you think you need to use that. Um, it depends what situation you're going to be in and what sort of sound effects are going on in that environment and whether or not you've got a very loud line of dialogue or shouting or laughing or something unexpected like a, uh, you know, some sort of explosion on set, that will really save you in, in those instances. Um, quite oftentimes it helps to record loud noises um, separately at a lower gain amount. So it's just good to know. So also we've got a pan option. Now, just to explain why you might choose to pan an individual microphone from these four inputs as you're recording. Well, it doesn't necessarily affect how it records, although it will if you're recording the main left and right. Um, the main purpose of doing this relates to the use of the director's audio kit, which is really, really handy, which I recommend you always use as long as you can get your hands on one on set. Always take it out. Even if you haven't had that conversation with your director or anyone else about whether or not they need to hear what you're doing on set, you should always expect that someone's just going to come up to you on set and say, hey, I want to hear what's going on. And that could be producer, director, script supervisor. You've just got no way of really knowing that, but it's better to be prepared in the same way that it's better to have too many microphones, too many batteries, you know, all sorts of things, just in case something goes wrong on set. But director's audio kit is, is super handy. And because the device here has two outputs. It's got a stereo output, main out one and two. That actually gives you two XLR outputs to send to two different director's audio kits. And this is what's relevant to the pan. If, for example, you had two different people on set who wanted to have two different feeds of what you're doing, um, there's different ways of doing that. Um, but panning is quite a music tech or a, quite a sound tech, I should say, way of doing it. You can send the sound from one channel to, let me see, sorry, it just came out of it. PFL, pan, tappy tappy. You can send, let's say, microphone one all the way to the left side so that one of the outputs is receiving that microphone feed. Um, and then maybe channel two PFL pan is going off to the right side. That means channel one is coming out here, and channel two is coming out here. And you can do the same for three and four. You can have maybe mic one and three on output one or two and four on two. It really depends. So the reason why it's useful to pan each individual track to the left and the right is that you might want to give two different director kits two different feeds, for example, one person might want to hear all of the channels mixed together to get a general impression of what you're recording. Whereas someone else, they might want to hear individual actors to check for performance, let's say, or enunciation or something like that. So you can send two different people um, two different mixes by um, using this panning function. But also, you've got this option here when you press output on top here. This gives you um, a load of extra control in terms of the routing of the device. So your headphone routing, for example, should be defaulting to monitoring the left and right, which is everything that's going through the device. But you can change that and you can listen to individual inputs um, and that's post fade, which is after um, their fader amount has been applied. Um, and you can also change the main output routing here. This is another way, instead of panning, you can kind of hard patch an individual input microphone to come out of the uh, M1 and 2 here. So the main output 1 and 2 doesn't have to be a mix of all four mics. You can manually control what's going out there, which is another way of sending one director audio kit, one set of audio instruction, and the other a different mix altogether so that they can just listen to uh, to an individual microphone, for example. So there you go, quite useful, and that should be post-fade unless you have a reason not to. Um, main out routing is quite handy there to be able to know where that is, and sub out again if you're using sub out, you can control there. 
So that just about covers um, the options in terms of sending out to a, uh, a director's audio kit. Um, just bear in mind as well that the uh, output has some additional options there. You could put a delay on, for example, maybe, maybe they're getting the sound before they're looking at uh, the picture on, on set and you can add delay or you can add an output limiter to protect their hearing in case they're listening to a particularly noisy scene that you're filming on set. You can limit the main outputs just to protect um, people's hearing on set. They should have volume controls on their director's audio kits, but always um, just be aware that you can damage people's hearing and it is essentially up to you to be in charge of that because you're in control. Um, obviously they've got their volume locally as well, so they have an obligation to be aware of particularly noisy scenes as they happen, but it's just good to know that. Okay, moving on without going too deep into one particular aspect of it. Um, the headphone level is down here and just be very conscious of this because the headphone level is an output volume level. So this does not change the input volume recording, the, the level at which the individual microphones are being recorded onto the disc. So this is generally something that you, you set carefully after you've done everything else. Um, if you're listening on headphones and you're not aware of the headphone volume versus the input gain, a big mistake that people tend to make is that they, they crank up the individual microphone's input gain or input faders, which is um, in that different menu there, you've got the input fader and you have to manually select that if you want to. Um, they, they do that. Um, so that they can hear better what's happening on set instead of using the output volume. And that causes distortion and causes problems. Another problem is that perhaps they have the headphone volume set too high um, and they're not conscious of that and consequently they are recording too low an input signal and their signal to noise ratio is bad because the input gain of the mic is so low they've got the headphone cranked. It sounds fine in their ears but there's a bit of noise going on there because they're not doing things in a logical order. You always set the input gain um, to reach that sort of Goldilocks zone as an approximation um, before you set that output headphone volume. So input and output volumes are different things. Usually the volume means headphone out. It's an output stage, not an input gain um, or trim, which refers to the input level. So hopefully that makes sense there. Um, you've got other options um, for input five and six here. They're kind of grouped together here, um, depending on whether or not you're using those channels. And you've got a slate tone as well. So simply when you press this, it provides a slate tone. Um, and this can be really useful if you want to just generate a burst of audio across all of your channels um, to kind of mark an in point um, of the recording. Or you want to um, send that to the cameras as well, just to give yourself some manual way of popping it in sync if you're not using time code if you're not using Clapperboard, and if you're not using Scratch Audio. So just an extra tool there to be aware of. And then once you've recorded, you've obviously got your stop, um, you've got your play, pause buttons and all that. And like I say, you can individually check microphones, what they're doing, um, even after you've recorded a take. So that's really, really handy and good to know. So just to mention as well, when you've pressed record, um, you can still make a lot of changes to the input gain, be careful with that, and a lot of other settings which you should be careful of as well. Um, but there are some things that you can't change, such as you can't arm or disarm a track once it's recording. But you can go into the menu and um, you can change just about um, everything that you need to, um, but obviously you can't change your um, recording resolution or anything sort of overarching like that. And the way that you know it's recording, it goes red, and the timer starts to run. And just be aware of your remaining recording time and um, make sure that you've got plenty of time on there um, before and after lunch in the morning and PM for your takes. And you can see the, um, the time code here is, is running. So it's generating time code if you wanted to send it to another device. But yeah, I'm just recording one microphone here. And the reason it's appearing slightly louder in the left right to the input is because um, the, the left and right volume is set independently from the input gain. So you might see a slight discrepancy there. Um, and obviously, if you've got um, all four mics on, it will sum the level up, and you might have um, a left and right volume that approaches 0 dB. 
Um, it doesn't matter too much if that uh, left and right volume distorts so long as you're not planning on using that left right volume um, straight away. The way that you work normally is you always record mics individually and you mix them in post unless you have a good reason not to or maybe you want to send the camera a rough mix or a like director's audio kit like I say. You don't need to worry too much about the left right but it's good just to be aware of it. So wrapping up I'm just going to have a quick glance at the device itself to make sure I've covered all of the most important features. I think we've covered everything on the front here. Um, you can mount these if you need to. Um, you've got these sort of um, points here to insert the Velcro when you're putting it back in the pouch. Four inputs here. This is the input side and this is the output side. So you can use it as a USB audio interface if you need to. And you've got um, additional inputs here. You've got your sub out and your headphones with a quarter inch to 3.5 mil adapter. If you lose that, you could be in trouble on set. You've got no way of listening back to what you're recording. So the small details really help and um, these go missing pretty easily. So it's always worth having these in your pocket, to be honest, as well as gaffer tape and batteries. Just want to mention one more thing about the F4 recorder. When you're recording a very long take, um, you might notice that it actually will go on to record uh, an extra file. So it will kind of, it will wrap up one file and it will continue recording on another file. And don't be alarmed by this. It just means when you put them in post, um, it's just sort of segmenting the files in manageable chunks because it has a data limit for each chunk of file. It's just the way that the XML generates. So um, let's say if you're recording for, uh, let's say two hours, you will lightly stop recording after a certain time and you simply put the first file up against the next one in your um, application and you won't hear that there's any difference even though they're separate files. So don't be alarmed by that, it's just good to know. Um, it'll all perfectly stay in sync. Um, if you have any sort of drifting out of time over the course of your timeline, it's more likely that that's related to the frame rate being set incorrectly against your sequence settings or something like that. So. Um, we do workshops on the workflow to do with those aspects of um, management. So just be aware of that and come proactively and chat to us in advance about these things. It's always a good idea to know what you're going into. You don't want to stumble into any particular setting. If something's set a particular way and you're not sure the importance of it, then come and speak to us and make sure that you're aware of that. So that pretty much covers the F4.